All right. Well, if we're not going to federalize it, or if we are going to federalize it, is say on pay the right result? Again, I think that you have to assess say on pay not only on its own merits, but in the context of an ongoing effort by activists, um, and I'll talk about who the activists are in a few minutes, but you have to look at say and pay in the context of an ongoing effort by activists, not only to increasingly federalize corporate law, but to shift the locus of decision-making authority in American corporations from directors and management to shareholders. Now, there's no more basic compens or question in corporate governance than who decides. It was a particular decision or oversight task to be assigned to the board of directors, management, or shareholders. Well, the Delaware Corporation Code, as is the case, I believe, in all 50 states, gives us a very simple answer. The business and affairs of the corporation shall be managed by or under the direction of a board of directors, not by or under the direction of the shareholders, but by or under the direction of a board of directors. Now, Harvey says, look, you know, historically, boards were impotent. They were rubber stamps. Uh, Ralph Nader in Taming the Giant Corporation, 1976, said that directors were cuckolds who rarely knew what their management spouses were up to. Um, and, and there's a certain amount of truth to that. I, I actually think one of these days I want to go back and, and write sort of the history of the board of directors. Um, and I, I think the tale is a little more nuanced than that, but I think it's basically true that, that certainly for much of, of this period, um, up through, say, 1980-ish, uh, directors were relatively weak. Um, and I am reminded, however, of a line from uh, the, one of the Lord of the Rings movies where Gandalf says, something is happening that has not happened in a very long time. And uh, Aragorn says, what's that? And Gandalf says, the Ents are awakening and they are realizing they are strong. One of the things that we've observed over the last 30 years is an awakening of the board of directors. And in fact, this has not necessarily been voluntarily, voluntary on the part of directors. We've been pushing directors to be more active. Um, the American Law Institute, uh, Principles on Corporate Governance, wanted to mandate a majority independent board. Uh, they ended up backing off of that and making it a recommendation. Uh, Delaware law has created strong incentives for you to have independent, disinterested directors on your board. Uh, the stock exchange listing standards for a long time have required that you have uh, an independent audit committee. And now, of course, post Sarbanes Oxley require that you have a majority of independent directors, so an independent nominating committee, an independent compensation committee. Um, the law has really awakened directors. And Jeff Gordon wrote a really wonderful article in the Stanford Law Review last year that traces sort of over the last 60 years how the law has increasingly mandated director independence. And while a lot of studies are indifferent as to whether or not independence is beneficial, Gordon makes a very persuasive point that the reason studies often find it hard to determine whether director independence is beneficial is because a riding tide, rising tide lifts all boats. Everybody's been getting directors who are independent, and so it's become very difficult uh, to make those sort of comparisons. Um, and so corporate law generally adopts what I've called in my scholarship director primacy. It assigns decision-making to the board of directors or the managers to whom the board has delegated authority. That is the statutory model, and I believe increasingly it is the model of how things work in the real world. Is it perfect? No. Newtonian physics isn't perfect. It breaks down at the margins. Um, something about quantum mechanics, and we could get Stephen Hawking in here to explain that to us. But it works reasonably well for us. And I think director primacy is kind of like that. So again, the proponents of say on pay say, well, it's only an advisory vote. Okay, 
well, if it's only an advisory vote, why have it? And they say, well, it's just like 14A8 precatory proposals. Okay, well, why have them? It must be that you think they have an impact, right? That necessarily you think that they affect director decision making. And moreover, again, it goes back to the death by a thousand cuts point. We are chipping away at director authority, and every time we make one of we have one of these proposals, we say, "Well, it just restricts the directors a little bit," and then we have shareholder access to the ballot. Well, it just restricts the directors a little bit, and we have majority director vote. Well, it just restricts the directors a little bit. Well, you have to look at things in their totality and in their context. So let me end. And when I say end, I mean in about 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> by taking on the question that Harvey posed, sort of what's wrong with shareholders? Well, look, shareholders have no natural or inherent rights of ownership. All they do is contribute capital. And so, as Harvey put it, if we're going to give them a vote, it's not because they own the corporation, it's because we think they have the right incentives and that therefore that this is an appropriate solution to the principal agent problem. Well, is it in fact the case that shareholders have the right incentives? 